Welcome and thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, A Practical Guide to Alcohol Home Detox for GPs. I'm Chris Keyes, Drug Health Manager with Central and Eastern Sydney PHN. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work. We recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I also pay respect to Aboriginal colleagues joining us today. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the CESPN YouTube channel within the next few days. As participants, you will receive a link to the YouTube library. Please submit your questions tonight by using the chat function that's located at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. At the end of the webinar, the evaluation survey will pop up on your screen. Please complete this to allow us to issue certificates of attendance and we really appreciate your feedback. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter tonight, Dr. Chris Davis. Chris is a GP with a special interest in drug and alcohol and a recognised expert and trainer in this field. He established the Clean Slate Clinic in 2015 to provide in-person primary care, alcohol withdrawal and recovery services after successfully delivering this model in the UK. Chris will also outline a proof of concept for transferring Clean Slate to telehealth delivery, a project which we are supporting at Central and Eastern Sydney PHN in partnership with Sydney North PHN and Southeastern New South Wales PHN or Coordinaire. I also welcome the other members of the Clean Slate team tonight, Chris and Pia, who are online in the background assisting with Q&A. And it's now my pleasure to hand over to Chris. Thanks so much, Chris. And um, yeah, thanks very much to those three PHNs for, well, for giving me the privilege of uh, this opportunity of being able to, to share my passion with, with you all tonight, but also for funding the, the really exciting telehealth project that's particularly timely in this, in this pandemic. And, and I'll talk more to that um, towards the end of the talk. I guess I'll just give a very brief introduction into the Clean Slate Clinic and, and the GP-led home detox service that I run. But um, I really developed this passion for helping people change their relationship with alcohol uh, when I was working as a, a GP in inner city London. They were the PH, well, the PCT as they were called, the Primary Care Trust, which is the equivalent of our PHNs, were looking for more GPs to take on methadone prescribing and we're offering free education. So I, I undertook the, the year of, of education and brought that back to my practice and became a methadone prescriber, which I found really rewarding. But what I was really seeing every day in my practice were the effects of alcohol um, and, and what those effects were having on all of my patients, not just those drinking, uh, the physical effects, but particularly the mental health effects and the social effects, the, the child protection issues I was dealing with, domestic violence. And so I really became interested in how I could help prevent these harms. And at the time, there was already a GP home detox model called the Fresh Start Clinics. So I joined, became a Fresh Start Clinic GP um, and became the clinical lead for, for alcohol and other drugs in, in Wandsworth. And, and really what I sort of drove my passion was seeing people dependent upon alcohol and all of the physical, social, mental health effects that the alcohol was causing and being able to take them through a detox uh, and see how, how much better they were after detox, how their lives improved in, in virtually every sense. Uh, how I was getting thank you letters from family members, people were getting their jobs back, uh, they looked different, uh, they felt different, they were sleeping better. And I'd never done anything so gratifying and instantly rewarding in my whole medical career. Um, and so when I emigrated to Australia in, in 2014, I was determined to bring this model with me. And I was very lucky that 
had supportive partners in, in Peter and Chris and Bernie Rushton at Dildare Road, who, who really supported um, my vision of bringing this model to the Australian healthcare system. And we successfully ran uh, what I now call the Clean State Clinic out of Blacktown for two years and have brought it to my current practice at East Sydney Doctors in Darlinghurst. Um, and patients love this confidential model. It's proven to be safe and successful. And as I said, the most satisfying thing I've ever done. So my, I really wanted to spread this model and, and I've been educating GPs through the college program and, and through local educational events. Um, but, you know, these patients are seen as complex and time consuming. There's no extra remuneration for them. So really there's just my clinic and the Blacktown Clinic that are still still running. I haven't managed to encourage any of my colleagues to, to pick up the mantle and run with it. And so I've been getting emails from all over Australia from patients who, who would like uh, to have a sort of home detox uh, led by their GP and not a specialist service where they would have to maybe mix with drug users that they don't associate with or, or identify themselves as being. So when Chris Rain, who's joining us, um, and you may have heard of Chris Rain or know him from being the, the founder of Hello Sunday Morning and former CEO. Um, when he came to me with the idea of putting this model onto a telehealth platform, it was literally like a, a dream come true because now I could help, we could help um, any Australian anywhere in the country uh, with their alcohol, alcohol issues. Um, uh, my good old friend, um, Pia Tarastak, uh, is the sort of third cog in our wheel, and, and she is a health economist and health strategist with uh, 20 years of experience, in, um, firstly in the NHS, which is where I, I, where I met her, uh, then Deloitte, and now she's an independent health consultant. And so the three of us have set up this telehealth model, and, and we're very grateful to those three PHNs for, for funding a pilot, and, and I'm hoping it will spread Australia-wide. Anyway, that's... That's me, and I will um, quickly move along. So I'd really like to spend the majority of, of our session talking about um, how we can help our patients change their relationship with alcohol. And although people think about the detox and home withdrawal as the sort of as a cure sometimes, it really isn't. And, and really that detox is just one week in the patient's lives. So us as GPs and, and, and allied health professionals, we can do so much with our patients, even if we don't do the detox with them, getting them prepared, some motivational interviewing, having that supportive, non-judgmental approach that, that we're also good at, um, preparing them for a withdrawal if that's what they need, and also helping them in their recovery. Um, so even if, you don't feel you have the, the skills or the time to do the detox. There is, you know, you can still do 90% of, of the chronic disease management that, that our alcohol dependent patients need. So I hope with the first objective to build your confidence in, in undertaking home detox, um, but really more talking about uh, the whole wraparound care of, of these patients. Um, I'll go through the components of a structured home detox talk about the medications that, that we use, um, and then talk about recovery and, and how to support your patients in staying at their goals. And indeed, if they do lapse or relapse. We'll then spend a bit of time talking about the telehealth service and how you can use that to um, help your patients do that tricky detox bit. If, if um, you know, let us do that, that bit and, and then we'll hand them back to you and we'll talk about that later. And then hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A and, and discussions at the end. And, and look, please, if you have any questions as you go, please put them in the chat box. And, and there's a section at the end of each, there's a Q&A section at the end of each um, passage. And I hope to quickly answer any questions you might have. So this is just a bit of background as to what the problem is. Um, so yes, 15 Australians die every single day from alcohol misuse, and it is the most dangerous addictive drug in the world. And we don't really talk about alcohol as, as an addictive drug. And, and, and perhaps we, we should be put it, terming it like that more often in our, in our parlance. 
Um, I sat on an ice task force meeting in 2014 about the ice pandemic, um, which obviously came before the COVID pandemic. And, and what I was surprised about was th they were remarking about the incredible number of ED presentations in New South Wales, nearly 3,000 um, for ice. And on the, on, the, on the same page, in fact, directly underneath, it said the number due to alcohol use was 13,000. And, and it gave you the historic numbers and, and the alcohol numbers hadn't changed. And yes, indeed, ice numbers had increased and even doubled. But I was like, hold on, why are we all talking about ice? Why aren't we talking about alcohol? Why aren't there adverts of aggressive people in the emergency department who are drunk? Um, uh, yeah. Also, um, it's an, again, this you know, third statistic it really is talking to the indirect effects of, of alcohol. Um, and how many people are, uh, are indirect victims of alcohol use. And I guess some more sort of current stats, uh, you know, 20 to 27% of people are drinking more in lockdown and through the COVID pandemic. And a very recent study has just shown that 80% of all ambulance call outs in Victoria have been for home alcohol incidents. I mean, just think about that. You know, eight out of 10, 80% of all ambulance call outs were to people's home with alcohol related incidents. I mean, that's massive. Anyway, we all know what the problem is. We see it every day in our clinics. So, so what, we, what can we do? And, and I think probably the most important part of, of this talk um, and of what we can do as GPs is something that we're, we're already really good at. And, and that's giving our patients a safe space to talk about the problems that they are encountering. Um, and certainly motivational interviewing is, is such an important part of helping people change behaviors that they may or may not be ready to change. So that starts by that non-judgmental approach. Um, it takes on average 18 years for people with alcohol problems to seek help. And that's partly because of the stigma around seeking help for, for drinking and being branded an, an alcoholic. Um, so we have to offer this non-judgmental space. And, and so just by asking the question frequently, you know, we'll ask the question that our new patient checks and it will say in best practice, you know, light drinker, and we'll see it as there's light. And we just won't ask the question. We might know them for 20 years and never ask them again because we've written light drinker in the top corner but people's drinking habits change all the time. So it should be a question that we ask regularly. You know, how are you sleeping? How's your diet? You know, has, has your drinking changed during lockdown? Just being curious and keeping that as just a safe question that they can answer. Certainly the language we use is really important. And, you know, I've just used the word alcoholic, but that really is not a word I ever, I ever use unless a patient chooses to use it themselves. And AA have, have taken ownership of that term, um, but really as a doctor, it has no medical definition and has a lot of stigma around it. So that's sort of an obvious word that I think we should avoid, but um, things like clean or sober, it's been a little bit harder to take out of my vocabulary. And NADA have done a fantastic document about uh, non-stigmatizing language called, called Language Matters. You can put that into Google. I, I give it to all my medical students, it's fantastic. So again, real keystones of motivational interviewing is, is really finding out what's motivating the patient. What, what are their goals? And, and ask them to set their goals. Ask them, what, what would you like to happen with your drinking? Rather than, I think you should stop. Um, we talk about resisting the writing reflex. And patients are often contemplative if they're talking to you about a, a, a behavior they want to change. So in their mind, they're already weighing up the pros and the cons. There's sort of no point telling a smoker that smoking is going to kill them because they already know that. So if a smoker is weighing up the pros and the cons in their mind and you tell them you need to stop smoking because it will cause lung cancer, what, what they're doing is you, you've already taken up the cons. You said the cons for them. So now all they're thinking of is the pros. Well, I really do enjoy smoking. And when I don't smoke, it makes me feel terrible. Um, and, and so you become defensive. 
And so now you start shouting louder and then they start shouting even louder and you've lost them. So really what you wanna do is get the patient to say what the cons are themselves or find, find the reasons that they would make the change. So, you know, ask them, you know, say, what do you like about smoking? Or I should really stick to drinking. <laughs> what do you like about drinking? Um, and uh, what don't you like about drinking? You know, and, and really get them to, to come up with their own motivations. Very early on, I, I, well, even now, I make the mistake of suggesting things. You know, why don't you try an alcohol-free day in the week? And, you know, instantly I'll get reasons why they can't do that. So now I'll say, you know, can you think of any ways that perhaps you could cut down? Um, and if they really can't, maybe make some, some suggestions you think will be appropriate to them. You know, do you think you could uh, have a glass of water next to your glass of wine and drink out of that? Or, you know, do you think you could maybe not drink at home? And, but, you know, it's very collaborative. So yes, really concentrating on the positives of change rather than any losses. You know, so I talk about, you know, how did you feel when you had that break from alcohol? You slept better. It wasn't that amazing, you know, and, and, and you can have that again. Um, and yeah, the mark out of 10, so a classic motivational interviewing question. And, and so, you know, often I'll say, if so we're preparing, maybe thinking of doing a detox, seeing if someone's in the action phase, say, yeah, give me a mark out of 10. How ready do you think you are to make this change? If someone says eight, like, that's great, eight. You know, why did you say eight and maybe not a six? And then they'll tell you all of the good reasons that they want to make a change. They say, oh, well, you know, I want to make a change for all these good reasons. And then you might want to explore why they said an eight or, you know, not a 10 to see what their anxieties or worries are. So, when I get my patient in for the first time, and often patients have booked in to see me to solely talk about alcohol, and, they'll, and, and I will know that beforehand, but I always make sure they get a long consultation. And rapport building is really important. And, and off the bat, they can be super nervous. People haven't wanted to tell me their names or their date of birth. Um, and you can see this is a real difficult topic for them to talk about. So again, making it a safe space. Um, saying thank you for coming in. I know this might be a difficult topic for you to talk about, but um, you, know, you might want to uh, reiterate, reiterate your confidentiality rules. Um, and in that first assessment, I'm not trying to do too much. If I build rapport, that, that's enough for me. Uh, I, I obviously need to do some safety netting. So I take a history and, and I'll start by um, saying, look, uh, it's great you're here to talk about your alcohol. Why don't we just talk about some general health questions that I need to ask as a, a new patient check? And then we'll come, we'll, we'll talk about your alcohol and come up with uh, some goals and maybe a plan of how to get there. Um, so you've got that little bit of family history. Do you have any allergies? Talking about stuff not related to alcohol, just to let them realize that this is a safe space and, and that, that you're okay and this is a good idea. Um, when they leave, I make sure I give them a planning sheet. And this planning sheet is there to remind me of all the things that I want to do. Um, and I'll come on to that in the next slide. And I make sure we book a follow up. I book them another long appointment with me. And I book them uh, a nurse appointment before they come back and see me. And I'll explain what that is for. So in that first appointment, um, I'm not too worried if I haven't asked every question because I know that I'm going to collect all of the information I need in my assessment pack. And I'll, again, I'll show you what's in that assessment pack. And it's a pretty simple uh, thing. I'll do a blood test for all the usual things, liver function, I do magnesium, a full blood count, uh, I do coags, uh, what else do I do? I do sugar, I do cholesterol. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, no, nothing magic. Uh, and I get them started on thiamine uh, straight away. And, and anyone who's a daily drinker should be on thiamine. Uh, you know, they did a report in the Drug and Alcohol Review of 2017, which said that the most common drug used to help people with problem drinking was Valium. And this was seen as a guideline, you know, was a guideline based, you know, perfectly normal thing. And I was like, Valium, I mean, Valium, you would give to a drinker just for that one week and then that's it for the rest of the time. They should be on thiamine and anti-craving drugs for maybe months, you know. 
So just always think of thiamine protects their memory, but also and their nervous system. But it's also a nice way of them setting an intention every day. You know, I'm taking my Valium today. You know, it's a it's a reflective tool. I say 200 milligrams three times a day is like the most that I would use. There's no great guideline on this. I tend to give people uh, my heavy drinkers who are skipping meals, maybe malnourished, losing weight, high dose oral thiamine. Um, I was using IM, B dose fought, but it's fraught with problems in primary care. It's hard to get, it's expensive. Um, it's a sore, it's a painful injection. So now I've settled with the oral thiamine. Um, I think if I'm really worried that someone needs IV thiamine, they should probably be in patient care. Or I will um, just work with them for longer before their detox, make sure they're on oral thiamine for longer than like two weeks um, and try and get them to cut down their drinking and, and improve their health that way. Always get them to take, use a drink diary. And again, for the ambivalent patient, the drink diary is amazing, uh, amazing tool at um, it's just holding up a mirror to their own behavior so again you're just giving them a tool you're not saying put down or stop just saying just keep a diary of what you drink and the evidence shows if that's all they do if you just give them a drink diary they keep it for six weeks they will be drinking less alcohol at the end of that six weeks you know a proven easy brief intervention tool plus it also gives you nice information if they come back with it on the drink diary I'll, I'll, uh, and again, that's in another slide. Um, that really helps us work out what people's triggers and associations are and helps us when we're planning their recovery too. I touched on the pros and cons list. Get them to write it down. The things they do like about drinking, well, they're the things that we have to replace when they're in recovery. So if they like drinking uh, to help them relax at parties, then perhaps we need to do some work around social anxiety. Um, and I'll often uh, start that work before detox um, using like this way up uh, or the MySpot clinic or, you know, certainly most of my patients, if not all of them get mental health care plans and we can start that before, um, way before detox. A resource list, I'll give them and I'm, I'll show you that at the end. I'll go through all the resources in quite some detail. I get them to keep drinking and, and that can be quite a hard thing to say um, and, and a hard thing for some patients to hear because often they've come ready to stop. They want to stop that day but a period of mindful drinking is really powerful. Drinking when you don't want to is a great way of changing your relationship with alcohol. It no, no longer becomes this fun thing or this release. It becomes uh, something that you, know, you sort of have to do to prevent your withdrawals. Uh, a great way to start changing that mindset. Um, it, it, again, it's also a really good way of, of helping people uh, work out what their triggers, associations, and underlying reasons why they're drinking is. Plus, of course, at this first appointment, I haven't had a chance to really properly assess how risky their drinking is. Um, I might ask if they've had withdrawal seizures in the past. And, you know, and if, if that's the answer, then definitely I want them to keep drinking to the same amount um, until I've done the bloods and the assessment pack and I can detox them safely with, with diazepam or, or oxazepam. And then I book that review appointment. This is a, an example of a drink diary. So really, what time do you start drinking? Because that's obviously a big trigger. So if you're always drinking after work at 6 p.m., then what can we do at 6 p.m. that's going to help with those cravings? Can you be in a gym or somewhere where there's no alcohol? Or can you just eat earlier? You know, where are you drinking? Is it always at home or is it always at work? Uh, who with? How much does it cost? Again, another nice, oh, you know, this is how much I'm spending. The target standard drinks is like, how, how much did you set out to drink that night? And I think that's, quite, again, quite a nice mindfulness tool. How did you feel before that first drink? And what were the consequences of it? Again, I, you know, if a patient brings this back and it's obvious they've filled in the diary the next day or same day, again, that's another nice way I've, I've got of judging how ready they are. Sometimes people, they won't have filled them in or they'll, they, you can tell it, they just filled it in in the waiting room and written 7777. Uh, and I'm like, oh, maybe we need a bit more ambivalence work. Um, and, and again, I give them so many tools. I always make it clear that none of them are compulsory. These are just tools that you might want to use if you think they're going to be helpful. I don't want to think that, you know, I'm imposing anything upon them, that this is something that they're choosing to do. So in my assessment pack, um, it's really, 
couple of pages of looking at their risk. So children at home, any complex medical history? Have they been in rehab or detox before? You know, certainly people with repeated detoxes uh, have, uh, you know, can have a kindling effect or a, or a higher risk. Kindling effect is really sort of a theoretical risk of uh, increased risk of seizures the more times you go through a detox. Have they had withdrawal seizures before? And although I have, uh, don't listen to this word, but I have done home detoxes for people who've had withdrawal seizures before. That is really my only absolute no-no, generally. Um, I do an ICD-10 tick box. I guess the ICD-10 ICD tick box is a quick, sort of quick and nasty way of deciding whether they're alcohol dependent or not. Um, and the, the audit questionnaire, next uh, questionnaire on the list, is a better way of doing that, really. Um, I want to know their social history. Do they have a support person? Do they drive a car because they can't join the detox? Uh, they have gambling or other drug problems? And, and what's their support network like? So if you're scoring 20 over the audit, you're deemed to be alcohol dependent. And that means that you're then uh, eligible for GP management plan and mental health care plan. And, I do, and that's why I get them to see the nurse before the second appointment, get them to bring in their assessment pack, give it to the nurse. They'll do the blood pressure, height and weight, the things I neglected to do in my first appointment with them because I was too busy building rapport. Um, and then they come to me uh, with the assessment pack filled out, their drink diary. My, uh, the nurse has already <coughs> templated some GP management plans and mental health care plans if the patient's consented and eligible for those. <coughs> and it saves me time. In my, appoint in my appointment straight after the nurse. So they might come to me in that um, session. They may have already stopped drinking, which happens often, or they may be ambivalent. They may just want to cut down or change their habits, in which case I carry on with my motivational interview. I direct them to an insight guide with some brilliant um, brief intervention tools uh, done by Queensland NHS, Queen NHS uh, Queensland Health, <laughs> not NHS Queensland. Um, I talk about pacing skills, some mindful drinking, again, um, talk about dry days, find out what their goals are, um, find out what their goals are, set some boundaries or help them set their own boundaries about how they can reach their goals, get them to share their goals with a support person and have a consequence if they don't meet their goals. Um, again, a bit more motivational interview and then always book a review appointment. And that, that's so motivating. If they know they've got to see a doctor uh, in another month, that's really a useful um, uh, way of becoming accountable. Uh, and accountability is really important. Being accountable to themselves, most important, but also friends, family, and the GP. Um, any questions here? Nothing so far. If you have a question for Chris, just you can raise your hand if you'd like, and you can ask your question that way, or the chat is open and ready for you. We also have a poll. Oh, yes. Great. So how many patients are you seeing each month that may, you think might need or might be suitable for a home detox? So each month, that'd be no patients, don't see many drinkers, maybe you're not asking the, the right questions, one to five, six to ten, or even more than ten. Um, I can't, I'm not in control of this poll, so I'm not sure how many people have voted yet, but um, let me let me know how we're going. I might just wait a few more seconds. Great. And that's right, I think the more times you ask, uh, a, a medical student said to me the other week that she'd been working with a GP who didn't treat alcoholics. Now, that sentence made me bristle, as you can imagine, A, because it had the word alcoholic in, but also because she will be treating alcoholics, she just won't, won't be asking the right question. Great, so all of us are seeing, you know, maybe one patient a week that, that might be suitable for a home detox. Some more than 10 um, and a few none. Okay. Um, we have a qu question as well, Chris, in the chat. Can a GP use Valium if a patient is feeling withdrawal symptoms? Um, I will talk about this. Um, quick answer would be no, um, very quick answer. And obviously you know your patients and it's a case by case situation, but I would always warn against the emergency detox. 
we're not set up to do emergency detoxes. If someone's withdrawing in front of you and they tell you they can't drink, they're not going to drink, you think they're at risk of, of DTs or seizures, they have to go to ED. Don't take that on yourself. You know, these detoxes have risk and they have to be planned. You know, I only do a planned detox service. If someone comes to me for the first time and says, I need to detox today, I'm like, great, I'll help you as much as I can. But, you know, I can't give you Valium today. This needs to be planned. There is no detox service other than the emergency detox service that will detox somebody same day. So, you know, there's, there's clinics, Northside Clinics, South Pacific, all these clinics that are set up for alcohol and drug detox. They don't take people same day if they're withdrawing. So don't you be tempted to do it either, you know, and, and people will come and, and they will they will ask for that. But what happens is we start enabling their habit. I'll talk about that later. Thanks, Chris. And just another question around whether participants will have access to our resources, apps, diaries, etc. I know we're going to share some of that a bit later on. So, yeah, I should have said that right from the outset. You're going to get all of these slides, absolutely. But also at the end, I'll, I'll, take, I'll do a quick whistle stop tour of our website. On our website, there are uh, links to um, an article I wrote for Australian Prescriber. There'll be a link to this webinar, um, but also our resource, uh, all our resource lists. Um, some motivational interviewing tool, pros and cons list, drink diaries, they're all on the website. So it's a one-stop shop for all of these resources and, and yeah, we'll talk you through that later as well. All good? Yep. Thanks, Pia. So um, I guess this sort of comes to that first point. You must feel comfortable and safe. So you're giving a drinker Valium. And alcohol and Valium is deadly in overdose, very easy to overdose. When you hear of celebrities or, or people choking on their own vomit, usually that's benzos and alcohol, and really dangerous in overdose. So you've got to be pretty sure that someone's not going to be drinking um, before you give them Valium. Um, and you know, how can you do that? Now, well, I'll talk you through how, how I do it and how we should do it. But then if someone comes to you in withdrawal saying, I need some Valium doc to, to stop me, you know, how do you know they're not going to leave and, and drink? Um, so you as the GP, you feel comfortable and safe before you embark on this potentially risky uh, procedure. Uh, generally, as a rule of thumb, you know, less than 20 standard drinks. So that's like three bottles of wine a day or less. They're drinking more than that. They generally just try and spend a bit of time helping them cut down or suggest inpatient detox. No history of withdrawal seizure. That's a complete no. Um, support person, ideal, you know. I feel so much more comfortable and safe if I know they've got a support person with them. Um, that's been a little bit difficult with some of the detoxes we've done in um, lockdown. But, um, and if they don't have a support person, then you need to really think about whether it's something you want to do. And there's a good reason for someone to go in to the hospital for a few days. They need to be in a safe environment. If there's a lot of drug use, a lot of drinking around them, it's probably not best to do a home detox. And again, no complex comorbidity, but very, very rare have I not been able to do a home detox because of someone's liver function or um, mental health. You know, yeah, of course it happens, uh, and but they're obvious. You know, you, you, you know, you 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 wouldn't feel comfortable and safe um, detoxing somebody who is actively suicidal, end stage liver failure, uh, or you know, pregnancy. Uh, that's sort of an obvious one, really. So I've got them back. I've done my mental health care plan. I've done my GP management plan. Um, and we're getting ready to do a detox. So they've just come in from the nurse. They're ready, definitely. They've got their support person. Uh, their environment is good. We talk about when would be a good time to detox. And I really try and put the brakes on them a little bit. You know, certainly if they've got a wedding or a holiday, you know, I suggest maybe we just do the detox after that, those high risk events. Um, so, I, you know, sort of the longer the preparation time we've got, the better. Go through the blood results and, and, you know, having mildly deranged liver function or raised MCV, a low magnesium, low platelets, high trigs, all those things that alcohol can cause. Generally, just is a good, I just use it as a motivational tool. You know, it's like, look what alcohol is doing. You know, in X amount of time, these things will normalize. Always do their blood pressure. You know, blood pressure always drops. Even if it's normal, it will drop. Really good motivational tool. We go through the assessment pack, look at their drink diaries. 
uh, go through the resources again, see which one they might have looked at, suggest some more. If you're a mental health care plan, talk about AA, smart recovery. So we're already thinking about recovery um, before the detox and certainly thinking about, you know, is there dual diagnosis with PTSD, ADHD, depression, anxiety, all those things we see all of the time and, and you know, common reasons why people self-medicate with, with alcohol. And, you know, do we want to start treating those things right away? And certainly the evidence suggests if we can start treating mental health conditions at this point, people do better than waiting until they've stopped. That might not necessarily mean starting them on medication, but certainly, um, you know, getting them in touch with the right services, talking about exercise, lifestyle, their diet, all these things we know are really, really important and as GPs are good at talking about. So we've done all that, and so I booked them a detox. So the detox is, uh, starts on a Monday because I start my week on a Monday and I need to see them four days in a row, ideally. Um, so I won't start on a Friday because then if they're in severe withdrawal Saturday, Sunday, they can't get hold of me. Uh, I book them in a nurse appointment and, and then an appointment with me straight after Monday to Thursday. Uh, it used to be Monday to Friday, but Friday uh, I now do this telehealth thing. So I just do four days, not by. I do a urine drug screen on day one, but don't feel like you need to do that. Um, I like to do it because I do loads of them and you know it's an extra safety blanket for me. Um, plus really what I wanna know is that they're not taking benzos, um, being dependent on benzos and alcohol together really needs, you know, it's a higher seizure risk. You know, I don't know how to dose if they're already on Valium, that means they've got their own supply, it means it's too risky for me. Uh, we do a breathalyzer every morning. Um, if they blow over day one, which often they do, uh, as long as they're blowing 0.1 or less, and, and that's, this is what they do at the inpatient units, if they blow 0.1 or less, you can give them Valium. And, and people will have withdrawal seizures before they hit zero. So be aware of that. But what I like to do is get them to, uh, we do all the other things, uh, and then get them to go and have a coffee, have some breakfast, get them to come back. And as long as I can see that it's below 0.1, which is still quite high, but it's dropping. So I know they've not had a drink recently and they've got a support person, you know, and I'm not too worried about other things. I'll give them the Valium. I might want to check in with them in the afternoon if, you know, they've blown high. We do a C work. Um, I forget what that stands for. Community Initiated Withdrawal Assessment, I think. Um, and we do that OBS. And then the patient comes in. For me and on day one i'll give them support information for the patient and hopefully that their support person is with them or i've met them pre-detox and i've given the support person some information about what to expect as well all of this is on our website um the support person yeah check in on them do they need referral to alanon i talked to them about alanon or fds online family drug support online um, Turning Point, I've got some brilliant uh, resources for families as well. So I now direct them to Turning Point. I give them a patient contract, which I'll run through. I should really call it an agreement. A lawyer told me, and I actually prefer patient agreement. So I keep meaning to change that. And then I give them a medication chart and map out how I think they should take their Valium through their detox. Uh, I give them, uh, I actually give them Valium. So I have a stock of Valium in a locked drawer, in our controlled drug drawer, in a nurse signs out with me because I do so, so many of these. But a daily prescription with a pharmacist is absolutely fine. I would just I would just call a pharmacist and say, you know, this is what I'm doing. You know, let me know if there's any issues, if they're turning up drunk or if they're worried. And it will just be for a week. Um, I also am lucky to have 24-7. In fact, we all are because we're all in New South Wales. The Addis card, Addis is an incredible service, 24-7 manned with uh, staff, I should say, with uh, fantastic people, uh, trained alcohol counsellors. So another really nice safety net for me. So I know that if it's three in the morning and they're withdrawing or they're suicidal or they need someone to talk to, they've got that Addis phone number. So I always give them that on day one. This is what the patient agreement looks like. The main things on here for me are that I've said in writing that they can't drive while they're taking Valium. Um, I also... Um, points out again, because I've already told them that they, this is it, you know, this is a break from alcohol, that if they drink alcohol, that the, the detox will end. That doesn't mean my support for them will end. It just means I can't give them any more Valium. Um, so, 
you know, I get them to sign that on day one. So if they come back at day four and they've had a drink and, you know, then and they want Valium still, I can say, well, look, this is part of the, the program, but please keep coming back to see me every day and, and we'll, we'll take it from where it is. It doesn't happen very often. It has happened a handful of times. And, and I always think, okay, I've rushed this. That patient wasn't, wasn't ready, wasn't, wasn't in that action phase. What could I have done better in the preparation? And I go back to the preparation and get start the motivational interview off all over again. So we see them Monday to Thursday. Um, if I'm worried about them on the Thursday, I'll get them to see a colleague of mine on the Friday. Uh, I give them daily diazepam. And that week, again, gives me a, such a privilege to go on that journey because I see them get better every day. And I get you know four or five days to really plan what their aftercare is going to look like. You know, I can spend the whole session talking about exercise and recovery, talk about their nutrition, got some brilliant allied health uh, people who help me with that dietitian, exercise physio. I've got an in-house alcohol counselor, which is amazing. Some really good psychologists. Um, and so, again, it's making me feel safe that the patient is going to be supported once I'm not seeing them every day. And plus that they're not just relying on me for their care, because that's not good for me either. Um, yeah, and again, lots of chance to go through the resources. Look, this um, this is a di this is a dosing guideline I've put together from a UK guideline and an Australian guideline. And look, you know, it's so flexible. I wouldn't pay too much attention to it. <laughs> so, I mean, generally, it's a quite a nice rule of thumb. So you so you can see how much they're drinking, what they got in the assessment pack scores for their SADQ, the severity of alcohol dependency questionnaire. Um, and then uh, I, you know, I see what they're, how they're like that morning, how much have they drank at the weekend. You know, I guess an average amount I would give them, um, say they're on two bottle of wine a drink, two bottle of wine a night drinker would be 10 milligrams QDS. And I'll always, you know, and if they're off work, they've got a support person, you know, I'd rather give them too much than too little. You know, I want this to be a comfortable, safe uh, experience for them. If you know, they, they have insisted that they're going to go to work um, or they have stuff to do. Um, I don't know. And then I, I might just give them a little bit less. I don't know. But yeah, it's very flexible and it, it's symptom initiated. And if they're not sure, if they're not sure when to take it, I'll give them a short alcohol withdrawal score, which is an abbreviated withdrawal questionnaire designed for the patient to fill in. It's on our website. Um, it's not in this part of this talk, but you can see it on our, on our website. This is the medication chart, dead simple. I just explain what diazepam is for to make them feel comfortable, to help them with cravings, to help them sleep, you know, when to take it, you know, when not to take it, you know, tell them if, you, if you're feeling great, don't, don't take it. Um, but they must write in where it says take it. You know, I don't mind if you take it or when you take it, just tell me the time that you've taken it and bring back any that you didn't take. Um, so they've got through that week really well. And most patients find it really, they're surprised, you know, I'm grateful. They're sleeping really well. They're feeling really good, you know, and you've gone on this journey with them and getting them back for that post-detox review is really rewarding. But they're nervous, they're anxious. The Valium is ending. So, um, yeah, be clear, no more di diazepam. Please don't ever give someone who's a heavy drinker diazepam. It's actually contraindicated for anyone with a prior history of alcohol dependence. So even if they were alcohol dependent 10 years ago, you shouldn't be prescribing them Valium um, unless it's for this actual purpose for detoxing them. And, and that's done in a staged way. Um, using Valium, anyway, yeah, it's a, it's a bugbear of mine. And you know, if you are gonna do uh, home detoxes, please do the stage apply. Please don't give, give anyone a, anyone really a script of 50 uh, Valium, unless they're dependent on the Valium. And again, you've got them on a, a benzo contract and you're seeing them regularly and it's a stage supply because it's such a dangerous drug in overdose. Um, we start them on some anti-craving medication, probably use that in about 90, 95% of my patients. I recommend them, they're safe. And as GPs, unfortunately, we're really, really bad at using these evidence-based treatments. So now Trexone has a number needed to treat of nine, Tamprel a number needed to treat of 12, uh, preventing people uh, relapsing to, uh, to dependent drinking. That's a really good number needed to treat. You know, a number needed to treat 
with aspirin to prevent stroke is one in 50. Yet you would never not give somebody aspirin. They've done two big studies, one in the UK, where only 6% of UK GPs are using anti-craving medications in people in recovery. In America, it's down as, one, as low as 1%. So we're not good at using these treatments. And I'll talk a bit more about, about those uh, soon. Again, active, active aftercare, definitely essential. Um, AA really works for improving in the Cochrane Review um, and, and really that's that's sort of the social connection, the continued motivation. Um, so, I, you know, I, 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 AA is great for some people, um, but if they're not an AA person, you know, make sure that they're tied in with a psychologist, that you're all regularly reviewing them. They've got the, um, uh, the phone apps, the websites, uh, all those things, uh, anything that they think will be helpful. Uh, I might repeat their bloods if there was any abnormalities at those times. I'd keep doing their blood pressure and, and regular K10s. Well, that's a very quick whistle stop tour of how to detox somebody. Is there any questions? A few questions, yep. And there'll be a poll coming up as well in a moment, guys. So, uh, first question is if the patient doesn't have any chronic medical condition apart from alcohol dependency, can we arrange both a GP management plan and mental health, mental health care plan for the patient? Uh, yes. So alcohol dependency is seen on its own, is seen as both mental health condition and a chronic physical health condition. Um, I checked that out with Medicare when I first started. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Uh, and can you talk about your cutoffs on the uh, CWA, on the withdrawal assessment? Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't really have cutoffs, I guess. Um, so, I mean, I've got the advantage in my face-to-face -face clinic that um, I get to assess them face-to-face. -face. I go through their CEWA score. I might repeat it um, uh, once they've done it with the nurse. And, so, and again, my, my Valium prescribing is so flexible that I would sort of look at the whole picture and increase or, or decrease my Valium um, dosing accordingly. Uh, I don't know if that sounds like I've dodged the question, but I guess there's no black and white, really. Um, the SIBA score, and certainly, you know, certainly if people have underlying anxiety disorder and you ask them how anxious they are, you know, again, it's going to be a seven. Um, so, yeah, I'm afraid I don't have any nice easy cutoffs to share with you. So there's a few more come in. Uh, so urine, the urine drug screen you talked about, is there a specific request box in the pathology request forms for that? Well, you know, by the time you've got one of those, but you could do that in the week before. Um, yeah, and yes, you can do a urine drug screen through the labs. I mean, I have my instant urine drug tests, which are about $25. Um, I have, I'm mixed billing. So I've sort of absorbed that cost. My practice has absorbed that cost because, you know, about 30% of my patients will go through the detox privately. But that's how I do it. So, you know, I think if I wasn't doing many, I would probably only do it if I would, there was concerns that perhaps you weren't getting the whole truth or you were concerned that they were dependent upon benzos or other drugs. A couple on anti-craving medication, Chris, and also some feedback that you didn't dodge the question. You're all good. Um, so <laughs> the first is, what about disulfiram? Um, okay. Yeah, I'll come to that next. Okay. The next one is, can we use... I'm going to say this wrong. Sorry, everyone. Fluoxetine as anti-craving medication, especially for those with mild to moderate depression, according to Beck's depression inventory. So, yeah, I mean, they've done a lot of studies and, and, and actually SSRIs are one of them. We, as GPs, we prescribe SSRIs for um, alcohol cravings more than we do anti-craving medications. Uh, so, yes. By all means, you can use fluoxetine, um, but I would be using that to treat underlying anxiety and depression rather than alcohol cravings. Alcohol cravings can cause anxiety. Um, Campal is particularly good for people who are getting a lot of anxiety around their, their cravings. But um, So I, I guess I wouldn't use fluoxetine for that purpose, um, but I might use it for, for their underlying mental health. And, and to be honest, you know, if you cannot start, if you know they're going to go through a detox, uh, you know, it makes such a dramatic change to somebody's 
they tend their, their depression their anxiety their sleep you know that often you know again it depends what their baseline is and what their underlying issues are often they don't need the medication so if, un, unless I, I really try not to start someone on NSSR while they're drinking heavily um you know if I can avoid it and, and most of the time I can um Okay, another one on anti-craving medications and a couple of others um, on other themes. So uh, naltrexone, is that is it suitable for binge drinkers? So this is an example of somebody binge drinks on weekends um, and then misses work the day after. They're also on the antidepressant debinflaxine and seeing a psychologist. Yeah, um, yes, I use naltrexone for binge drinking. Um, uh, let me come on to that. I've got a, a slide on anti-craving medications. I'll, I'll, I'll be sure okay. to that. Okay, a couple more, and then I think we'll go to the poll. So can you ever do detox without breathalyzer testing, given the potential cost of purchase for breathalyzers? Yes, you absolutely can. And um, again, that's sort of a nice to have. Um, and some of the, the specialist units don't use breathalyzers. So, you know, I think it's usually obvious if someone's intoxicated, um, and you can usually tell if it's by someone's motivation. You know, so yes, you don't need a breathalyzer. That, that's not essential. And the last one, unless any more come in, uh, patients who are undecided between gradual alcohol reduction and home detox, any thoughts on, on that, any advice? Yeah, great. I, I, um, so I really like gradual home reduction in a way because what that does is it gives me a longer chance to prepare them. So uh, if I'm going to, you know, if they're doing gradual reduction, I say, look, 10% a week, you know, especially if there's any seizure risk. So that's, that's quite, it's not much, you know, they'll often do it a lot quicker. So, I mean, if I'm, if I'm sure that they've got low seizure risk, certainly rule of thumb, bottle of wine or less per night, you know, you, can, you don't really need Valium to detox someone who's well and drinking a bottle of wine or less per night. They can stop on their own quite safely most of the time. Um, but if they're drinking more than that, you know, if you're unsure, you get them to withdraw really slowly and do all that great motivational interviewing stuff, get them a mental health care plan, get them on the website, doing the alcohol experiment, you know, getting them back. And then either they can do it, which is great, and, and getting them to put all their effort into doing it. Either they do it, amazing, or they don't. But they know that they've tried their best and that isn't a route for them. And then you can help them do the home detox and they're really well prepared for it by then. Thanks, Chris. Bertha, I may, might get you to launch the second poll. And there's just another question for you, Chris, while we're doing that, which is, do you use much baclofen? A very, no. Um, so more so if someone's using GHB um, alongside alcohol, baclofen is, um, it's popular um, in France and an emergency physician in Perth who does a lot of street drinkers. So for people who really have no motivation to stop, um, you can give them baclofen in increasing doses uh, and generally they will drink less, but it causes a lot of lethargy, a lot of side effects. You've got to slow them, inc increase them until they're on a very high dose. There's risk of overdose and the withdrawals are pretty bad. So I don't really like it. And I very rarely need it because Campal and Altrexone and Pedetic are great. Um, amazing. So nearly a third of people have taken a structured people through a structured home detox in the last 12 months. Yeah, and look, I think GPs are doing it more than we, we know. Um, can I ask those 10 if there were any adverse events or were they success stories? Maybe put them in the in the chat room. And, and we'll talk about that towards the end. Um, let me go on to the anti-craving meds because that might answer quite a lot of, of uh, people's questions. So they've gone through their detox and naltrexone is generally the medication I recommend. Uh, I think it's a little bit better than Camprel. So Camprel and naltrexone are the only two PBS listed anti-craving medications. Now, Trexone works by blocking the uh, opioid receptors in the brain, which really dampens cravings. And I've seen it work, you know, and as much as people don't think about alcohol, best case scenario, obviously it doesn't work that well for everybody. Um, and they'll stop taking it and the cravings will return. Um, so I like it for that, but also it gives us that nice safety net that if they do drink while they're on Naltrexone, uh, it takes a lot of the pleasure out of the alcohol. 
So they're not meant to be drinking. They have an impulsive drink. It's not giving them that that hit, that warm feeling. And they're thinking, okay, well, I shouldn't be drinking anyway. Maybe it's not worth it. I'll put it down. So it sort of reduces the risk of a lapse turning into a full relapse. I really like naltrexone. Very safe medication. Got to be careful if they've got, uh, you know, LFTs, you know, three to five times your limit of normal. If you're really worried about their liver, be careful if they're on opioid medications, of course, you have to be careful. And so I give them all an alert card and I get them to write a disclaimer. So they definitely know they cannot take opioid painkillers whilst they're on it because they won't work. And then they're near at risk of overdose. So they have an alert card next to their driver's license in case of a car crash. That's never happened, but one day it might. Um, and if they need to have an operation, for example, I get them to stop the naltrexone uh, 48 to 72 hours before, and then it's out of their system and they can have their operation, no problem. Camperol, again, really nice anti-craving medications, very safe, uh, less side effects than naltrexone. Naltrexone, you can get some nausea, headache, uh, reasonably common in the first day or two. So I get them to start on half an naltrexone um, for day one and day two. Uh, if they're getting side effects, I get them to stay on half a tablet until those side effects settle before they go up to a full tablet. Camprel, a bit of tummy upset, maybe, but not really. Problem with it is, problem, a pro and a con, a pro, a, you know, a con is that it's two pills three times a day. But at the same time, that's three times a day. They're checking in with themselves. I'm taking these pills because I'm making the decision not to drink. Um, if you're over 60 kilos, two, three times a day, under 60 kilos, two in the morning, one at lunch, one at dinner. Um, if someone is still having cravings and they're on naltrexone already, I'll add in Camprel so you can have those two together and it has an additive effect. Um, Antibus I don't use very often. Um, really the evidence shows you, says that 70% um, of people who take Antibus drink on it to test it out. So you know, now you know that you're giving someone a drug that could kill someone if they drink. Yeah, it's unlikely to, but there has been a death or it can put them in ITU, certainly if they've got underlying medical conditions. Now, I'm giving you this drug that might make you really sick and there's a seven out of 10 chance that you're going to you're gonna drink on it. So that makes me a bit nervous. You know, they can react to vinegars, hand sanitizer. And really, uh, the other thing the evidence shows is that it only really works if it's supervised. So either they've got a friendly chemist that will, they'll go to every day um, a, a alcohol service or, you know, a support person who's, who's supportive and involved. So I have to have a motivated patient, ideally a support person. And usually antibuse is sort of a, you know, we've tried naltrexone and Camprel, these things haven't worked, you know, it's a bit of a sort of second choice. Again, back with them, we just sort of talked about Topiramate's got, uh, there's a naltrexone versus Topiramate trial going on at RPA at the minute. Um, Again, Topiramate has side effects, uh, weight loss, headaches. Uh, it's not listed for this. So, and I don't need to use it. I've got two really good drugs at my disposal already. Um, again, part of the open, non judgmental approach is being honest about lapses. And, and certainly, you know, I talk about lapses as, as something that is common and, and normal, and that. They're, they're things that I really want them to come and tell me about so we can work through them, um, turn them into a positive, focus on the positive. So if someone's had a lapse, that generally means they drank and, and stopped. A relapse would be where they've, they've drank and they've gone back to square one. Um, so if they've drank and they've stopped, you know, again, that's, that's an incredible positive. You know, it means that they know they can do that if it happens again. Again, to reflect on what the triggers were that led to that lapse. You know, and talk about you know what extra support they might need. What have I missed? Maybe they should be on naltrexone or Camprel. Should we try a psychologist at this point? What about AA? Um, so they've had a full relapse. Again, if I can catch that relapse really quick, quickly, I might do a short detox. Say they've just been drinking heavily for one week. I might just give them a few Valium. Again, with that daily check-in, that's really important. You know, um, to nip that one in the bud. Whereas a, again, another rule of thumb is I try not to do home detoxes within six months of, of the last. And that's because of that kindling effect that I mentioned earlier on. Um, yeah, referral ambivalence cloud playing. Yeah, is there something that I've missed? Is there an underlying health condition that I might not have uh, considered? Um, and would they benefit from a, a three week stay in a private clinic or, or even a, a longer stay in somewhere like William Booth House, which is, I'm a VMO there as well, where we do nine to 12 month programs there. 
Um, maybe, maybe that's what they mean. So the emergency detox, yeah, I, I think we covered that. Don't be tempted. Um, I had one patient who'd been having emergency detoxes every two to three weeks, which had meant that he'd had about 10 detoxes um, in you know the last sort of five or six months. So now he was petrified of um, having a drink and, and stopping without having Valium. And, and, and what we're doing then is enabling the habit. So if someone can drink, if they've got a box of Valium at home, hey, they're at risk of overdose, but they know they can have a big bender and they've got the Valium there to help with the withdrawals. So we're just sort of enabling that habit. You know? So it's contraindicated and it's not helping them in the long term. So no, no to emergency detox. You know? You know, if they if they're really you know, you know, they either go to ED or it's really hard to say this, you know, have a drink, fill out my assessment pack, start the thiamine, come back next week and we'll do this in a in a safe and planned way. Because when I rush detoxes, they have got a high risk of failing. That's when people lapse really quickly. No support person. So if they haven't got a support person, then often I'll get them to come in twice that day if I'm in the afternoon, or I'll get my nurse to phone them in the afternoon if I can't. I might get them to see the pharmacist for a stay to buy through the day if I'm if I'm worried. So that at least the pharmacist is checking in three times a day. I'll only do that if they're low risk of seizure. You know, if they're less than one or two bottles. And so yeah, be wary if they've got no support person. Think about referring in. Yeah, lots of people tell me they can't take time off work, and I, and I get that. And I really strongly try and encourage them to. This is literally one week in their working life. And when they get back to work after that week off, they're going to be far more productive than they were the week before. Um, that's one reason. Uh, yeah, but we want to really make the detox week as stress-free as possible because stress is a trigger. So try and get them to clear their decks, uh, have lots of healthy food in, get all the alcohol out, um, get them to do some housework they've been putting off, you know, really chill out for that week. If they're trying to work, look after the kids, detox, you know, the chance of uh, lapse is just much higher. I always sign them off work with a medical condition. This is a medical procedure. Just sign them off. I sign off their carer as well. It's totally fine. So these are my results. Um, I audited my face-to-face -face, um, service when I was out in Blacktown and I um, presented it at a couple of conferences. Um, these results are comparative. They're slightly better, <laughs> I like to say. <laughs> so they are a little bit better than my results from the UK. Um, so, and, you know, these are self-reported. So reduction in alcohol dependence was really based on an audit questionnaire and self-reported complete abstinence. Um, you know, the, the, there haven't really been any comparative results with inpatient detox, but I would certainly, from what I've read and what I know, these results are better than inpatient detox, but it's because we're comparing apples and oranges. You know, I send all my difficult ones to the inpatient detox, you know, so I've cherry picked all the nice mild to moderate uh, dependence here. But as you can see, you know, 12 months, 60% of people um, are, are, have a reduction in alcohol dependence, which is how the studies tend to gauge success. You know, but what is, what is success? You know, it's, it's hard to say. And, and I just think retention in treatment, you know, I, I'm still seeing patients four or five years later and whether they're drinking or not, the fact that I know that they've got somewhere to come if, if they want help, I, I think that is success in itself because even if they're still drinking, at least uh, we've got one eye on their, their mental, their physical, their social health, and we can do all of the, the good GP stuff that, that we're all also good at doing. Um, yeah, so that was a bit of recovery planning. Um, any questions about that, Leah? Got a few, it's a very practical question. Where do you get naltrexone alert cards from? From Generic Health. Um, so they're the company that make it. Go on the website, phone their number. You'll have a big box of them on your desk the very next day. <laughs> I did it last week. Great. And then a few sort of prescribing related questions. So uh, the first one, how long can you continue naltrexone? Yeah, really good question. Um, so the guidelines would really encourage people to stay on naltrexone or camprel or disulfiram for three months. So three months is this real golden time in recovery. Um, there's a lot of uh, neurochemical changes that happen in your brain when you're dependent upon alcohol. It messes up your sleep. You know, your, it, it reduces your dopamine receptors. So life is a bit dull. 
uh, you know, reduces your, your GABA receptors, so you're a bit more anxious, and, and that's the pathway Campfire helps you on. When you get to three months, you know, it's a real sort of golden, golden period where people really start finding the joy in the small things. You know, they'll come in raving about the possum they saw in the tree, or, you know, they'll show me a photograph of a, a leaf or tell me about the walk they went on where these things had no meaning to them when they were drinking because that the brain was only getting the dopamine from the alcohol. So I really try and encourage my patients to get to three months. And I know that if they get to three months, their chance of making long lasting change in their relationship with alcohol is much stronger than if they start drinking again after uh, one month or even two months. And, and that, that carries on. So if we can get them to four months, five months, six months, again, their chances of long-term controlled drinking, managed drinking, or, or ideally abstinence, right? None of us should drink alcohol, right? There is, n there is no health benefits to alcohol. We should all be abstinent from alcohol if we're just talking about health. Now, that probably isn't the messaging that we should be giving to our patients because of what I said right at the beginning, but that's the truth. Um, so keep them on anti-craving meds for a minimum of three months if you can. But I've had patients on naltrexone for two years. Now, that's too long. They didn't need to be on it, but I had no reason to stop it. They were doing really well. They were like, please, can I carry on for another two months? It kept them engaged with me. So I said, fine. <laughs> A few more, Chris, and then I'll move you on because I know you want to get to the next section. Um, so how do you choose and what sequence do you use between naltrexone and Camprel? So generally naltrexone first. Um, it's my preferred. I think it's a bit better um, uh, unless they are taking opioids for pain and I can't use it or they're likely to or they've got an operation or, you know, um, or their liver's really bad. So naltrexone I use first. Uh, Camprel used to be first choice. And now come sort of second choice. Um, so that's sort of the order I do it generally. And can any GP prescribe the anti-craving medications you talked through earlier, or do you need extra training? No, any GP can prescribe, and please do, they're safe. I mean, the with now Trexone, you've got to phone the PBS line for authority, and they want to know that the patient's in a comprehensive treatment program with the goal of maintaining abstinence. Now, the goal can always be to maintain abstinence, you know, the, and, you know, what's a comprehensive treatment program? I mean, so, you know, obviously there's, there's leeway there, but I, get the, the, I think the reason they put that on there is it being misprescribed and giving people who are dependent upon alcohol, Camprel or naltrexone while they're still dependent upon alcohol, it's just not helping them. It, it's, it's not, it's not, not, work. it doesn't work. The Sinclair method um, which you might have heard of, which is giving people now track time where they're drinking to try and reduce their pleasure. It might help for the odd patient, but in a, in a systematic review of all the studies of it, it doesn't work across a population of people. So again, we're, it's really tempting to think, great, they're dependent on alcohol, I can give them a pill, come back in a month. You know, it's like throwing a diet pill at somebody. You know, if you don't, they're not going to change their habits. It's not going to work. Anymore? Uh, one, a couple more, another one's coming. So how long do you continue the thiamine? Yeah, good question. And no great guidelines on it. So if they're pretty well, and most of my patients are pretty well, you know, they're working, working mums, uh, you know, they're eating, they're all right. They're usually on one to two bottles of wine. They're coping with life just about, they just need a bit of extra help. I'll get them to take high dose thiamine, maybe even just twice a day if they're having three meals a day. And then I usually get them to carry it on for a month. My, my real heavy drinkers, I'm worried about their memory, their cognition. You know, I can get them to keep them on for, for longer. You know, if, while they're drinking, they need to be on thiamine the whole time they're drinking. Because when you're drinking, your body uses thiamine to metabolize the alcohol. And you don't absorb thiamine when you're drinking not very well. So all your drinkers on thiamine. Um, and again, anywhere between 200 to 600 milligrams a day. Again, that's just a bit of a judgment call. Um, I rule the thumb, keep them on for a month. I tend to just tell them to finish the bottle. Um, as long as I know they're not drinking, they're well, and that they've got a good diet. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and then just one clarification on the naltrexone, which is when you ring for authority, are they restricting supply to one month? Two. Two. So you okay. get a month and a repeat, but that's really nice because you want to be seeing them as a minimum every two months. So I, I tend to follow up my patients weekly um, after detox. Uh, 
and, and some patients daily because they that's part of their accountability. Um, and then, you know, as a very minimum every two months to give them their taxonomy script or at least review it. Great, that's all the questions. Thanks, Chris. Really good questions. Thank you. There's, um, yeah, I, there's lots of, I could talk to you all day about this. It's, it's great. And I'm obviously missing things out as I go, which I, yeah. So yeah, thanks for your questions. They're great. Um, so as I said, when Chris, um, who shares my passion for uh, changing people's relationship with alcohol came to me in October of last year and said, why don't we put this on telehealth? Uh, I was just chuffed. And it's really, uh, developed a whole life of its own and it's so exciting that I can offer this to to Australia or, or we can and we've got a team around us two fantastic nurses um, obviously Chris and Pia and um, so it's really the same model put onto a telehealth platform um, it's changed we change it around a little bit but our main goals were really to help Australians who otherwise couldn't or wouldn't access detox services. So as I say, you know, people can't access mine or the Blacktown service if they don't live in reaching distance or coming in for that daily appointment. Um, people don't want to use inpatient services. There's a lot of stigma around them. Um, 80 to 90% of dependent drinkers don't need inpatient detox. They don't need it. And the gold standard is community detox, but they don't have access to it um, and totally I, I you know I, I'm a full-time GP and, and I've been doing this for a long time and you know even I run late when I'm doing this I realize how time consuming and complex it is so we've really designed this telehealth model with the busy GP in mind um, we're not going to take your patients we're here to just do the tricky detox bit um, we will inform you uh, every step of the way so um, on entry and whether they've self-referred, we'll ask you for a patient health summary um, and some blood tests if we can't do them ourselves. And we will tell you when their detox starts. And I will provide you, or, or one of my colleagues, uh, 28 GP colleagues, will provide you with a 721 template, um, which you can then build to Medicare. So you get the GP management plan um, and with my suggestions of what a good recovery plan for this patient will be like. Um, so we'll communicate you with, with you every step of the way. And if you want to contact me uh, or, or us or the team, you can do that through the website uh, at any point. We will also have, uh, we're lucky that the PHNs have funded this, which has enabled us to um, have University of Sydney do an independent evaluation of our service. Um, we already know this model works, it, you know, not just from my audit, but it, it's well recognized that GP community-led detox is, is safe, effective, and up to 20 times cheaper than inpatient care. Um, so we know it works, but they're really doing a feasibility to study to see whether telehealth is an acceptable model for this. Um, my uh, specialist colleague of mine out in Auckland, when the lockdown happened, uh, we had to do over 100 high-risk home detoxes to patients that really should have been in her inpatient unit. Her name's Vicky McFarlane. And she did over 100 uh, home detoxes, no face-to-face -face contact at all, um, with no real adverse events. The worst that happened was people drank during the detox. So I know that this is, is a, a safe and acceptable model. Um, yeah, we really uh, want to make it a, a, a great client experience. And, and that's where the technology can really help, help us. Um, you know, we have a chat service, an uh, email address, and... So they can hopefully, well, they can contact us when they need us, as opposed to maybe trying to get a phone call to a reception to for my patients currently who can't get through on the phone anyway. Um, we are also following them up for 12 months, which I think is, again, a great little safety net for, for you as their GP. So when I get my patients in my clinic, I literally print out a wad of paper this thick. It's not great. <laughs> not great for the environment. It's not great for the patient because they've got all this stuff they've got to put in their pocket. They don't want anyone to see it. They've got to take it home. They've got to fill it in with pen. It's really clunky. They lose it. So now we've got all of our resources on the website, which you have access to as well. Um, we send them out a care package. Once they've had their first assessment, we send them out a care package with the, a little pocket breathalyzer 
Um, that's all part of uh, the, the program. And they get to use the breathalyzer while they're still drinking as a bit of a mindful, reflective drinking tool. And then when they're going through the detox, we get them to blow into the breathalyzer. It connects to a phone app and they can hold up the, the reading to us. Um, they can even take it into the pharmacist before the pharmacist gives them the Valium. Then we have the 12 month follow up. Um, I guess the um, potential downsides is that you don't get that face to face interaction, which is gold standard, right? We all want to see our patients. But in this climate, we know we can't. And certainly if people are remote and rural, they can't come to their GP every day. Um, so that's both a pro and a con. And uh, most of the components of the telehealth uh, service are nurse led. We've got two incredibly brilliant and experienced nurses uh, who've been doing this for years when one's a, a nurse practitioner. Um, and we're really lucky to have uh, these expert staff that helps to keep the costs now, but you know, um, yeah, that's certainly how the model was run in, in the NHS. Um, yeah, they need to attend a pharmacy rather than getting their Valium with me. But again, that's another nice little safety net. Um, and yeah, the partnership with, with you guys is super important, um, as I already mentioned. So these are the inclusion exclusion criteria we already really touched on this so just the mild to moderate alcohol dependence really that less than 20 25 standard drinks a day you know no withdrawal seizures over 18 you know they've got to have a gp really um because you know if they're not suitable for our service i need to be able to communicate that and and signpost them onto appropriate services you know I, and again we've already talked about the exclusion criteria they're the same so this is what the model looks like You'll identify clients who might be suitable. Uh, you can refer them to us via telehealth, via, via telehealth. No, you can't. You can refer them to us via secure messaging. Uh, you can phone, you can send us a fax, or you can just get the patient to refer themselves through the website. Um, I, if you're going to do that, I would at least show them the website. And certainly when we're talking about the resources, it's great to demonstrate how they work. And uh, the evidence is shown if you show them the phone app, I've got about 20 alcohol apps on my phone and I think this one's going to be good for you. Look how it works, isn't it? Pretty engaged. So show them our website. Um, we will then send them a suitability questionnaire. We'll see if there is uh, some fully funded PHN spaces for them. It's also a private offering. So they can pay the full program. The full 12 month program is $3,000 as a private offering. Again, if you go into Northside Clinic for three weeks, it's about $25,000. Um, we are working with some uh, private health insurers to try and uh, get people private access that way. Um, again, this is the model across the middle, pretty much the same, except they once they've been referred, that our nurse will do a, a telehealth assessment. And again, that's the, the same assessment pack, going through the blood test, getting them on the phone and starting the motivational interviewing stuff. We contact the local GP, ask for bloods uh, and, uh, and a health summary. Then we have a second nurse assessment, make sure we've got all our ducks lined up in a row. Then they'll see me or one of my colleagues. I will plan their detox and their medication regime, phone the local pharmacist, do an e-prescription to the local pharmacist. Patient will then go to the local pharmacist each day um, after the nurse has assessed them. So the nurse will assess every day using the SEWA score. They'll get the patient to blow in the breathalyzer. They'll ask the pharmacist to do a blood pressure. Um, and they will speak to the pharmacist on a daily basis, just in case the Valium regime needs to change. Then at the end of the detox, I'll do a post-detox review. Same, same, anti-craving medications. I will write to you, tell you what I've started and why. I'll give you some naltrexone information. I'll tell you what monitoring is needed. Very little, usually some LFTs after a month. Uh, and, and encourage you to continue the prescription if the patient thinks it's helping. And I'll send you uh, model 721. Uh, I will hope that you'll do a mental health care plan, you know, either before or after, uh, and you can build a 721723 uh, yourself. Um, and yes, and then we follow them up weekly for the first month with my nurse, and then every quarter uh, until 12 months is up. So we're very lucky to have had funding for 35 patients. Um, I think we've already taken five patients through. Um, and if your patients, if you are working in CESPN, in North Sydney Health Network or Corden there, uh, then there are spaces for your patients uh, publicly funded. Otherwise, currently they will have to pay uh, the $3,000 if they want the full service. 
Um, so yes, we'd really love your patience. If we can get the 35 through and get this evaluated, then it's going to make it um, much easier for us to start accessing those patients in regional Queensland, in the Northern Territory, in Aboriginal communities across the country. Um, and we really need your, your help for that. And we need your partnership. I mean, these are your patients that, that we're really just helping you with uh, the, that one week withdrawal. Well, you know, a bit of a wraparound care as well, of course. But, you know, we, we'll do the, um, those tricky bits, the time consuming complex bits, but they're your patients and, and you know, we'll be completely collaborative with you. These are all the ways that you can, you can refer to those. Um, so I'm going to do my clever bit. I think I can and show you my resources. Has that worked? No, oh, no, here we go. I know that hasn't worked. Right. So this is our website. Can you see that? Screen. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the homepage. I mean, it's a work in progress. Um, we literally just started this in October and um, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, but this is what our website looks like and some FAQs about how it works. Um, that uh, is about, the, that's our care package that patients get with the breathalyzer and the vitamins. This is some information for you guys, how to refer, um, what you should do while you're waiting. There's a link to uh, an article I, I did for um, National Prescriber, Australian Prescriber. Um, again, some more resources in there, very similar to this. Uh, and then uh, this webinar will be on that page. Um, and then this is our resource page. So this is really where I would direct you to. So there's some preparation documents, um, pros and cons list, uh, brief intervention uh, leaflet. So if they're you know, pre-contemplative, not ready, just give them this handout, how to reduce your alcohol. And then click on, this is a resource list within the resource list. So this started out as a book list. Um, well, not, it wasn't 2012, it wasn't 2012, but it started out as a book list when I was in the NHS. And now it's got podcasts and blogs, TED Talks, websites, phone apps. Um, you know, This Naked Mind is a fantastic book. You know, and I haven't read all of these books. I, I have read This Naked Mind, but to, you know, if they're book readers, great. They look, read one of these books, get curious. Um, I really like Flip Pryor's blog, but mainly because I'm in it. <laughs> um, but a really nice uh, story of, uh, of her story of how she went through the Penn State Clinic program and gave up drinking for a year and actually hasn't had a drink for, for two and a half years now. Um, really good blogs, really important, puts quite complex um, theories into really simple language, which is why I love that. Dr. Judson Brewer, brilliantly named addiction psychiatrist who wrote a book on breaking bad habits. And he talks about that mindful drinking, drinking when you don't want to uh, really, really nicely. He actually does, he uses it with cigarettes and, and food. Um, there's a brilliant masterclass podcast on the Calm app, which is one of the meditation apps I'd point my patients to. Great websites, Hello Sunday Morning. Um, you know, it's a, such a fantastic, positive uh, community of uh, people who are supporting each other in, in really changing their relationship with alcohol in, in a positive way. You know, AA is often accused of using a lot of negative language, whereas Hello Sunday Morning is really positive, and they do a Daybreak app, which is fantastic. You know, it's really part of my planning document. Download the Daybreak app. Uh, instant online community in your pocket. If you need support at three in the morning, there'll be someone in Spain who will send you a, a happy message, um, but also free health coaching on that app. Um, lots of other good experiments, they call them, but, but resources. The alcohol experiment, so that this nakedmind.com is, is a website related to the book. And I get all my patients on day one of detox, or you could use it, say, day one of a dry July or day one of a break, to start the alcohol experiment. It's under free resources in this nakedmind.com. So it's free every day for 30 days. They'll get an email, some really good motivational and educational material. Some patients like sobriety counters, so they can count how many days they've not had a drink for. It tops up how much money they've saved, how many days of productivity they've saved, how much life they've earned. Uh, people like that. I quite like it too. Some Instagram pages. Uh, that, you know, I think if you can fill your social media, because social media is full of positive messaging around how 
alcohol is how we should be coping, you know, mummy's little helper. Um, so if we can try and change the messaging in someone's social media, and it will, if they start following these positive, uh, you know, hello Sunday morning, and uh, there's, there's loads of them, William Porter, they start following them, then the messaging on the social media will be how great sobriety is, how great it is to wake up with that with a hangover to wake up and say hello Sunday morning you know so yeah that's really important uh, we're changing that subliminal messaging um yes I think that is it um for the website uh, so really the resources the referral information everything you need you can find on this website any questions please phone us uh, email us and and I'll be there to answer any questions that you might you might have. Um, I managed to do that. I think I've spoken at a million miles an hour. My throat is quite dry, but I managed to get in within an hour and a half. We've still got a few minutes left. Um, if there is uh, any questions, I haven't looked at the chat room here. Um, no specific. There's been mainly questions that I've been able to answer as we've been going, Chris, the sort of questions around um, accessing funded places, which you covered uh, around whether the service is available outside of um, the three PHNs that are funding places, which it is. Uh, some lovely feedback for you. Um, people have enjoyed the talk. Well done. Thank you very um, much. And I don't think, it, yeah, if anyone has any other sort of final questions for, for Chris, just raise your hand or drop them in the in the chat um but otherwise do reach out to us by the via the website as well if there are things that you need that aren't uh, aren't on the website let us know and we'll try and get them on there uh, the question just come up in terms of accessing funding from the coordinator if your patient is from um a postcode from one of the phns that's funding so that's coordinator north northern sydney health network and central and eastern sydney phn you just need to refer your patient to us we'll get their uh, postcode when we do when they do the suitability test um and we'll make sure they access funded places obviously the phns will run right out if and when those places run out um but for now just refer to us and we'll take it from there um, I'm not sure I answered the binge drinking question. Uh, and, and so, you know, binge drinking generally is fueled from an underlying anxiety disorder, generally social anxiety. And, and, and social anxiety is just such a common reason, um, you know, people rely on alcohol. Um, so think, think about that. Um, uh, this Way Up is a brilliant free social anxiety disorder module. So that's quite an easy, non-threatening way to, to deal with that. Um, you can get them to take naltrexone daily. Uh, and that, if they want a complete break, some, if sometimes uh, there was a drug called nalmaphene, which we were piloting in, in the UK, which is a bit more of a targeted type of naltrexone, apparently, that is designed to be used on the day of a risky drinking episode to reduce your intake. Um, they didn't take it up here in Australia, but you can use naltrexone in that way. Um, but really, I would concentrate on finding out you know, what's leading to the binge drinking, do your mental health care plan and treat that underlying anxiety. You know, and refer to the exercise physio and your dietitian, you know, um, look at all the other pillars of recovery. Thanks for having us, Chris. Thanks, everyone.